Welcome, everybody. Um, this course, I'll try something a little bit different with you guys. And just so you know that we have a microphone and a camera up here as well. And it means that you will not get any handouts at all during this course. And you will probably realize quite soon why. And maybe you don't have to hear me that much. Um, and this is because this will be a very much of a case-based course. So we'll start by really going through what things we are using as scientists as tools and then use those in practice to do some of the things that we are sort of confronting every day. Just bringing together data from different sources, putting them together in montages, making all, all of these sort of overview illustrations and preparing them for submission to a journal. And I'll go through some of these things more hands-on than making step-by-step -step slides that could be very boring. So I hope you will be able to download this in the future and uh, so that that should be rather quickly out and available to you. Um, let me just double check that it is actually recording and yes it is. So the course as you've seen in the program is um, put into three days. So the first day today, we'll go through a little bit of fundamentals, just making sure that we are all on the same page when it comes to what is a digital image, what are the sort of components and build-ups of an image, how do we use technologies to represent something in a digital world that comes from the analog space. And then after the coffee, I'll go through a little bit on the tools and software that we'll focus on in this course and making sure that you all know what the different re uh, software represent and the versions we are working with here and how they are connecting together. Because nowadays you can choose either to have one software that can do everything but badly, like if you would do everything in Word, yes you can do it but it's quite awful. Or you can choose to have software that are well adjusted to do the different tasks and making them fuse together in the whole package in the end. And that's what I'm trying to push to you, why this is a much better approach. So today we are, of course, living in a very digital world. Everything that we do is represented by digits, zeros and ones everywhere. We just don't think about it very much. And this world is not very old. It actually comes, the first guy that made this concept is Claude Shannon. And he was one of these uh, really um, set shifters when it came to thinking about what digitalization of anything means. How can you actually transmit something that we visually see, how we hear things, and in the future also probably many senses and smells and tastes. Uh, although th th these things are much more complex, we now see v ways where we can start to actually divide everything up in dig digital fractions. And this is the key concept on making anything analog into digital, is how can you actually make something that is a sound wave, a uh, visual appearance, something else into zeros and ones. And the basic concept is very simple. When you divide something up in very small fractions, they can be summed in one way or the other into a number. So here in this case, you see a sound wave. And this is just has a wave like this form. And normally sound waves continue through air like this. What you can do is to divide it up into small time space fractions and start to see, well, how high is this amplitude at this fraction, this fraction, this fraction. And then you put that together into a long series of numbers. And then on the other side, when you have transmitted this, you can then rebuild the sound wave and represent it as the sound again. And this is what we use in our mobile phones, in our MP3 players, everything is based on this principle. And the closer, the more of these you can put together, the closer to the real world this will sound and appear. So it all has to do with how much data do we want to use to represent something. The more data we put in, the more real to life this can be in the end. And this is true for sound, but it's also very true for images. So this is just sort of a classical uh, um, luminescent uh, 
Western blot, and what you see here are photons emitted. So you have your protein of interest here, and it emits photons. And these photons are quanta in themselves, so you have a basic unit that is one photon. And these photons can then be put together and represented in a way of a histogram, saying how many photons did hit my sensor at every uh, single point. And this is what we then describe as a, a digital image, is the number of photons, if you have a, a sensor, is the number of photons that hits this sensor at ev every given time. And here again, the resolution is then dependent on how closely together you sample these. Because the photons uh, are, in themselves, they have a specific unit, but they also have a location in space. And the more closely you can represent where that comes from, of course, the closer to reality your image will look. This image also shows another point that's I important to know, is that digital images don't always represent what we see with our eye. And this may be obvious when you think about it, but it, there are many other ways that you can uh, produce a digital image that has nothing to do with how we, as humans, would see uh, images. Um, for example, we can image uh, ultraviolet space, we can I image infrared space, ra um, uh, radio decay, other things that we can make into images that we could never see. But they are in the same fundamental principle that you detect something and you represent it in space, and that becomes your digital image. You can, of course, do this with sound and other qu uh, quanta as well, and it's just one mean of producing a two-dimensional space of, of uh, measurement data. So in many ways, digital information is just measurement data as with anything else. And we need to treat that in the, the same way, not to lose a lot of information that we have in it. Or in some cases, it's very good to lose information because you want to squeeze it down. So if I want to send a photo uh, to a Facebook friend, it's great that I can uh, discard 98% of the data and make it really tiny. I don't really care that I lose a lot of quality. But when you want to publish it, you want to make sure that you don't do that. So this is one of the th main things we're going through today as well, is how can you work with the data without losing a lot of your information along the way? So when thinking about digital images, you need also to understand a little bit of how we represent color. And color is also, again, something that is built up by the perception of our brain, but it is also a physiological phenomenon. So when you look at white light, as you all know, the white light is a composition of a spectra of other colors. So when you divide it up in a prism, you see that all of these colors come out, but the composite is still the white light. And what we call this is additive colors. So the more you add on each color, the brighter it becomes, and in the end, everything goes into white, when all the other colors are coming together. When, when building this, you can see that you can actually represent most of our visual space by the composite of three colors, red, green, and blue. And these colors, uh, I'll go through later on, don't really cover the whole visual spectra we have, but it's close enough to, uh, for us to use. And this is great. It gives us those really rich, dynamic colors that you can see on a well-adjusted screen, but it rep represents a complication as well. So if you would think about this additive colors, it's not uh, trivial and it's not possible to represent this in a printed image. Because if you try with crayons, the more crayon you, you put on, it doesn't become white. So that's another uh, color system called the subtractive color space. And so the more of each dice you put on, the darker everything becomes. And this is much more complicated because that's not the way our eye views things. And it's much more difficult to represent the whole color space with this uh, type of coloring scheme. But at least the, the fewest colors you can use to get roughly the same color space is this CMYK color space. And this is the cyan, magenta, and yellow. This is supposed to be yellow, but with this uh, projector, it really isn't that yellow. And in the middle here, you see all those colors coming together. 
And that's the closest you will get to black with these three colors. And that's not really enough when you print something. So with the print pre uh, press development, and you also use black so much, they added the uh, fourth color, and that is black. It's called key here, so it's uh, abbreviated K, and that's from the classical printing presses where you had key as one of, of your uh, plates, because these were printed one by one, and uh, one of those plates was the black one. And so you see that the black here is actually blacker than the black of the other three colors together. So this is very important for you to know because everything you do publish will in the end be converted into this color space. And this can be very depressive sometimes. If you heard yesterday, um, one of the uh, founders of GFP was talking about his magical first picture of C. elegans where he got GFP expression in the whole animal. And he wanted to put this on science first page. And science said, well, GFP will not print great. Can we change the color? And uh, he was very upset with this because he wanted to make it re they wanted to make it into red. So uh, I'll show you why GFP is one of these notorious difficult uh, colors to work with, with CMYK. So th we just need to know that we have either the subtractive uh, coloring space, which is the CMYK space, or the RGB. And the more you maintain yourself into the RGB space, the easier it is for everyone, and the more happy you will be in the end. But it's a natural um, a necessity to work with the CMYK as well. So this is trying to represent how m many colors we can see. And how many colors these are, are is, is highly debated. But normally, we consider somewhere around 16.7 million different colors. And this 16.7 isn't just taken out of uh, thin air, but it's, it's based on the representations in bits of these uh, color spaces that build up 256 times 256 times 256 colors becomes 16.7. So that was a good approximation of how much many colors we can see. And when you would put that in, the absolute best uh, representations in digital images is this triangle here but our eye can still detect a little bit more colors out. And um, this becomes an impossible image to show on a digital uh, projector because it cannot show all these colors. But in the end, out here and out here are those very rich, very saturated colors. So the extremes of all colors are where things start to fail. So the extremely green fluorescent, the clear blue skies, those things are the most tricky to represent, both in digital images when you see them on the screen, but also when you try to print them. And so our screens are reasonably good. A high quality and normal quality is here. When it comes to printing, and that's where you have here, that's where things become bad. Because you see, it's only this fraction that's in here, this sort of uh, blob-shaped uh, uh, structure is what you can actually see in a printed image. So that you clearly see that it's much smaller space to work with, and that can represent some really challenges. So this is, again, something that is very difficult to show on this projector, and you can see this in the digital um, on, uh, online version of this talk, much more obvious. And this is, again, trying to represent GFP a confocal image as a CMYK. And it really looks depressive because you have these rich saturated colors and they become these flat, uh, more dim green colors. What's fortunate today though is that you're not linked or locked into having your data always printed. So of course we should always keep in mind that Today, I don't know the figure, but it's more likely 90, 95% of all readers of your papers will be online. And so that means that people will actually start seeing your pictures on a digital screen. And some people print, uh, today it's quite many, but with more and more high quality readers, I think we'll see less and less of printing of PDFs. So we can today have the mindset that we actually are making our papers for the online audience. 
not for the printed journal. It's easy to think that it's always the printed journal, but it's a very small fraction of everybody that reads the printed journal. So if you optimize it for the online uh, uh, experience, the, it may suffer a little bit for the printed, but you at, at least make sure that the most biggest uh, masses of your audience will see the high quality version of your images. And that takes a little bit of a different thought. And that's why one of the case studies here is how to prepare that into the best quality for the online generation of your articles. Another thing to think about is the size of your images. And this is a, something that was a challenge many years ago and has really decreased over time because the speed of our computers uh, the cost of storage has gone down. So they are, are really trivial matters today to maintain all your images in a high quality state. But it's easy to uh, degrade images without knowing. So that's why I want to go through this, not because it becomes important for you to uh, really manage your sizes, but you want to make sure that you don't lose your data early on. So you prepare an image for your nature paper in, and it would be sort of two by two uh, stamp sized. And then you say, this is a great image. I want to put it up on my poster. And then you don't have the data left. So publishing something in a stamp sized uh, in a journal and then wanting to reuse it later on, you want to make sure that you can reuse the same image all through. And that's another thing I want to sort of stress during this course. So this is just showing uh, how this can be a problem to spot just by visual appearance. So when you see a screen, even when you push it up like this, the resolution of a digital screen it has traditionally always been very poor. So the physical dots of a screen are much, much larger than the physical dots that uh, our eye can uh, distinguish and also the dots that you can print. This has changed with a, the newer versions of these called retina displays, where they have started to quadruple the number of pixels of each screen. But the majority of screens today are still these low resolution screens. And it means that you can saturate each pixel. If you have a digital image that is, uh, has more pixels in it than your screen can represent, uh, make, reducing that image doesn't change anything in your image quality of what you see on the screen. Quite the opposite, actually. So if you see here, it's again more visual on the, the um, computer screen. But these two images look almost identical. Actually, the right one here looks better on the screen. But when you see the data that's behind it, it's actually a massive difference. So this is uh, then much, much larger. You have these almost 20 times uh, the size of the data set, but it shows up the same way. So that, that's where the challenge comes in, to make sure that you maintain all the data you have in here, but you're always watching this version. So what you will see on your screen is to see each of these individual pixels, like in this case, you would need to zoom up of your image a lot to see it on the screen. So these are just magnifications of one of the dendrites of that um, pyramidal neuron. And you see these individual pixels showing up like this. So we need to always think about the end when we start to collect our data. What is the maximum size we would ever want to see this image? And then double that. And this may be strange. Why should you double this uh, maximum resolution? And it has to do with our digital cameras today. It's less important with scientific cameras that you have, have on a microscope than your camera on your iPhone. Because these cameras that are collecting data are collecting them in the way that you should look them zoomed out. You shouldn't look at each pixel. And why do I say this is a problem? Well. As I said in the early uh, part of the talk, digital images are counting photons. And when you count a photon, you don't know if this photon comes from blue light, from green light, or from red light. You just know that it's a photon. So how do we go from having photons into uh, these 16.7 million colors? 
Well, what we do is just as with confocal imaging, or uh, sorry, fluorescent imaging, we put on filters. So on each uh, pixel on your CCD in your camera, there is a small filter. So this filter filters out everything but blue light, everything but green light, or everything but red light. So what goes through each filter on each pixel is one of these colors. And it means that we actually, in color resolution, don't at all have the same resolution of our CCDs as we would think. It's actually, uh, for green, it's half the resolution, because green uh, has been put as half of these uh, filters on all pixels. And in red and, and blue, then each of those are actually only a quarter of the resolution. So that's why thinking with the end in mind and doubling that size, you will know that you don't lose data. You have enough data to work with all through your process. So you, you save a lot of time by thinking where could this be used and then scaling for that. Of course, sometimes you have technical limitations. Your cameras may not be able to take that kind of data. It may uh, have uh, too much of a scanning time in your confocal. Your dwell time on each pixel in these uh, laser scanning may be too little, so you don't get much light out. So there are many trade-offs to be made, but it's important that you know when you're making the trade-offs. So think about that when you're sitting at the microscope, when you're taking other images, where do you want to actually um, use these in the end? And you will gain a lot in quality by that. So this is just the example when you would print the two images I showed. And this is to know what DPI means. And DPI is a quantity that is dots per inch. So just by knowing that, it's quite trivial to mean, uh, know what it means. It just means that what is the density of point separation that you have in these uh, ways of viewing something. And again, the, the exact numbers are also debated. But normally, when we view images, we say that if there are uh, more than 300 dots in a line on, per inch, you cannot differentiate between the dots on that line. So when you print a photograph at 300 dpi, they become as close to photographic reality as possible. This is not really true. Um, if you would see the difference between a black and white drawing printed in 300 dpi versus a black and white drawing at 1200 dpi, you will clearly see a difference. So it's only true for photos, not for drawings and text. With those things where you have such a high contrast between things, you don't want it smoothened out, you need to go to a much higher resolution than 300 dpi to get the perfect quality. And this is one of the main reasons why uh, I, I'm pushing you to maintain vector graphics all through your process if you can, because the quality will be completely different in the end. So this printing process, and the, is, of course, making different types of dots. And our computers are storing ones and zeros. The main question is how these are stored and what they represent. Because they are just digital representations of the analog process. And th this can be a one-to-one -one process, but it can also be a much more complicated where it makes a lookup of other things. So in this one, this is the example you see up here, are ABCs looking identical on this screen. But the buildup of these um, lettering is dramatically different between these three. So the first one, as I said, is optimized for the screen. So when you blow up the B like this, you see all these individual dots. Um, the middle one is then optimized for this printing at 300 dots per inch. And the last one is vector-based. So uh, this just shows you that different ways can make a big difference when you magnify them. And I just wanted you to, at this point, have a couple of take-home messages from this sort of early introduction. And the first one is, when, when you're looking at the screen, you're really looking at the low-resolution uh, representation of your images. You're not looking at what can be your final quality, um, at least in traditional screens. And traditional screens have a resolution that is close to something called 72 dpi. 
They're normally a little bit higher today, but they are close to this original uh, dots uh, density. With the newer re resolution screens, like the uh, new MacBooks, where they have the retina displays, you quadruple that. So you double the pixels both in the horizontal and vertical axis. And then you're up to 150 dots per inch. Um, for print, then we aim to have this at 300 dots per inch. So you need them to really adjust for this when you're looking at an image. So if you scale it down to 25% of your original size, you can see this is what it would be printed. So that's very good to keep in mind. And that's, that's something you want to maintain both in publications um, when you submit them to journals, but also to maintain when you do posters. And it's when you do posters that it becomes more of a challenge because then your uh, image sizes will have to be in much larger. And that's also where you can start to cut down on this. If you don't have the data to represent it in 300 dots per inch, it's not the end of the world. But you don't want to have a poster that's built up on 72 dots per inch images. You will see that as blurriness and really be disappointing when it comes in a printed quality. So then, as I said, keep the end in mind. And then, then you want to uh, really uh, grab as much as you can. If it doesn't come at expenses of quality loss in other ways or uh, time consumption, just make sure that you have the best quality in and maintain that throughout. And then they say that the 300 dots per inch is insufficient when you're working with text and uh, illustrations of other means. So, this you want to get away from. Either you do it by brute force and going up to 600 dots per inch, 1200 dots per inch, but that, or you just go to these resolution independent imaging um, modalities that are like the um, vector graphics. And then you can forget about all of these resolution things. And I'll get back to why that is. So that's why you really want to maintain that um, uh, in, the, in the vector uh, graphics. So what are vectors? For those of you that have studied mathematics, you have a very clear view of what, the, what a vector is. And a vector has an origin, it has a, a direction, and it has a size. The size can be represented in many ways, in length, or again, can have different meanings. And orientations can be in uh, one dimension, two dimensions, three dimensions, 12 dimensions. That doesn't matter. It still can be a vector. It just has to have these uh, parameters of origin and size and a direction. And when you have those, it becomes a vector. Um, reality can be represented by vectors only. And if you do that, you have the difficulty of these soft natural shapes. So this is trying to represent a B, the, the character B, by just vectors. And here you have 28 vectors uh, representing this B. And you see it's a crude representation of a B. It doesn't have the font characteristics of this Garman font. When you add more and more points, adding more possibilities for these lines to become smaller and smaller, the closer to your the reality you want to have, you are. So for an um, online digital representation, 227 points with just straight lines gives you a quite nice B. And when you see this, you see that already going with straight lines only, you have here 227 points versus just this low quality pixel based one took you 1100 points to make the same thing. So just by representing it with vectors instead of pixels, you can simplify things dramatically. Then there is the possibility to add one other dimension. And this is curvation. So as I said, vectors are always straight lines with directions. But you can actually add also this to make sure that what you have between two points is bent. And this is what's called Bezier curves. And this is what we will focus on a little bit today, because that's the main hurdle for people to get into Illustrator, is to understand how to work with these Bezier uh, curves. And 
that uh, is a bit of a challenge. However, with text, as is something that we work a lot on, there are even better ways to represent it in an efficient way. And this is to make lookups. So when you think about a font, what that actually is, is uh, this Bezier curved version of a B, but it's referring to the same B in every place. So if you have 200 Bs on a page, it just says, put a B at this page, uh, uh, site, put a B here, put a B there, and it gives a couple of other parameters. So it still has a number of other variables to put in, but they're much fewer than these points needed here. So it becomes an even more efficient way of storing that. So this is just showing how that looks for the computer. So these are the points that were building up this, uh, these uh, 28 points in the B, and you go up like this. So with the Bezier curves, this has the same number of points as this one, but is much closer to the original typeface that was developed. And this is by writing the same character just using the font lookup structure. And there you have only one point, and this is where has it, does it has it have its origin on a page. And then it keeps other parameters like uh, weight of the time, uh, typeface, size, and uh, all of these other structures as well. So that's good to keep in mind that our typefaces we're working with are actually just Bezier curve representations of uh, the different characters in it. And they are look up from that and putting in to that place in the picture. And you can use that to actually start to modify your fonts in a good way because you can always bring them in. So you can go from this typeface into this one um, for each individual B. Then it becomes much less efficient. If you would do that for uh, your whole thesis and print that, it would be a very heavy document to print. So it's, uh, it becomes more heavy for the computer, but it gives you the option to actually go in and modify these, uh, each character. It also has another important factor, and that is that a typeface you always need to bring with you. So if you don't have the typeface, when representing, the, the file doesn't know how this B should look. So it doesn't have the lookup uh, and the source of this uh, font. So without the fonts, um, your image will not be able to be represented in the same way. But if you would go from this one and store it in these Bezier curves in your figure, then it can be shown in any computer, regardless of what fonts are there. And so this can be very valuable when you're submitting images and want to make sure that your typefaces are well represented in them. Then you can always have the option to go from here into this one. And I'll show you how to do that later on as well. So this is, as I said, called the Bezier curves. And this is the representation of the font. So now we get into the applications that we are normally using. And the core of this whole course will be based around these two applications. In this creative suite that we have, we also have the Photoshop application and the bridge. The bridge application is where you can sort your, your images, making sure that you know what is where. And it has some other useful tools that I'll show you as well. But it's the least of, uh, used of all these applications. And in this case, I'll show you that sort of the core is to understand how Illustrator works. Once you know that, it's much easier to add on in design. And you will know why you want to use that as well. So now when we're going and diving into Illustrator, I'm a bit before my, uh, the time here. so. Um, I thought I'll just go on with this and then we'll adjust in the end because some things always take much longer time than others. But before we go into that, we can have any sort of brief questions at this point that you would want to have uh, more explained. We can go through that now as we have the time. Everything is clear. No. Uh, but when, uh, so once the text or whatever is created, it's a text or another word. Mm -hmm. 
It's then the, you know, this nice resolution. But then when I finally uh, submit my 300 dots per inch image, the text in this image will then automatically be generated to the same level. So this is what you don't want to do. You don't want to convert your text into these pixels. You never want that text to become pixels. And this is one of the sort of main uh, issues that people do wrong is that they actually convert it into pixel base. So that, uh, that I'll show you how to avoid so that it maintains this vector quality even in the published uh, version of the figure. So then you don't need to think about that. When I scan a picture, uh, one of the devices about the machine is uh, you can choose the resolution in terms of micrometers. How is that represented in the uh, API? Is it even available? Um, not really. So what you will have to think about, that, then it's uh, micrometers of the blotting area that you are visualizing. So then it depends on the size of your blot means how the resolution will be uh, taken from that. So it's more on the uh, number of steps it takes to image on the blot rather than the resolution that you can use it in the end. So it, it's, with Western blots, it's, it's very specific because you're always working against yourself when increasing resolution. Because the sensitivity of a CCD is the area of each pixel that it has as acquiring data. And especially with Western blots, we're working really at the lower limits of sensitivity of a CCD camera. So there you want to make sure that each of those pixels are as big as possible. They, of course, make them cool and expensive cameras and try to make each pixel large. But if you would add two or f often four pixels together, of course, that will always be four times as, uh, as large. And then it means that you will have four times the number of photons hitting that pixel. So when working with Western blot data, you always have to see what um, amount of photons does this emit? What's the strength of my bands that I'm looking at? And then count backwards from that, saying how much um, light do I have? How long can I image this without it being a problem? Normally for publications, it's better to use a digital uh, CCD camera in the Western blot machine for a longer time. So you may be imaging it for double the time you would in the original, and then you would get more photons per these uh, CCD sensors. Um, so you can start with that and see, well, now I know how much light I can get into my camera. How uh, high resolution can I go without losing quality? So I, I would work in that way and then see what do I get out from, from my blots in the quality in the end. Mm -hmm. Laser. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then it could actually be a little bit different in the way that then you have the uh, quality of dwell time. So w when a scanning laser, you have two things that w are giving you resolutions more than you would if you have luminescence Western blots. And this is how big your area of your laser is that it's hitting and is exciting this data. You don't want the laser to be bigger than each of these resolution points, but you don't want it to be smaller either. So this is normally optimized by the, the computer uh, or the, the tool there. The other thing is how long time does the laser dwell on each point? So the slower speed of scanning, the more time it has to dwell on that point and the more uh, data you will get out. So there you can also work on optimizing the quality of what you get out in the end. But by having a slower scanning speed. But it, so it clearly makes a big difference as well. OK, so then we can go on to this second session. And this is now trying to know how these fit into this whole network of software that we normally use. And I try to put together this image not to show that these are all the tools that you ever use, but more dividing them into bins. So in, in my view, we have sort of these three different bins. We have our data generation and collection software. 
And this is where everything that your scientific data comes into. It can be your thoughts going into a text document. It can be uh, graphs that are generated uh, in uh, Excel and tables in Excel, making uh, statistics in SPSS, making your graphs there or in PRISM or in these other date, uh, software. It can also be these collection tools from microscopes um, where you get dig digital data in. And this is where you sort of create your originals. This is the data that you want to make sure you have at the end as well. This is uh, sort of your raw data and that should be with you all through the process. So the, what I try to propose always when working with this is that you want to make sure that your steps from this middle to your originals are as short as possible. You don't want to have 12 iterations of an image adjustments before you have it placed into your final montage. And there are many reasons for this. Um, and the first reason I want to go through is why I think we really need to de-emphasize Photoshop as a tool in science. It's one of those, it's the first tool that people go in and work with, but I think actually it's the least useful tool and the one that we should use most restrictively of all these uh, tools in this package. So when, when I ask people what they use Photoshop for, um, it mainly has to do with sort of image uh, adjustments for scientific data. Of course, for our personal images and other things, we have it for many things. So then there it is, sort of, you want to change the white balance, contrast, brightness, and other things on your images. You want to clean them up, making sure that they look nice. Uh, other things that people do with Photoshop is to crop and rotate their images, change the size of the images, annotate images, and insert scale bars and lettering in these images. So how many of you would use Photoshop to do that? Yeah, not all, but uh, that's at least good. So it's one step forward. Um, what, what I would say is that we can divide these things up uh, and then people make these photo montages there as well. We can divide this up, sort of drawing a line here. And you have this first part in here. And it really has to do with how you view your original data that comes in. And for people working with film, uh, it has always been sort of the traditional way of looking at an image is the, the, the work you do before you take the image makes all the difference of the quality you will have in the end. So you, you, when you couldn't go back, people were spending much more time before acquisition of your photographs or your data sets. And this is something I think is a pity that we have lost because when, when working with uh, data, it's very clear that junk in will always be junk out in one way or the other. If, if you have bad quality coming in, the, the software we have can now rescue it to a level where we can, are happy with it, but it will never look as good as if you would spend that extra minute optimizing your quality before acquisition. And quality in this uh, case means a lot of different things. There are many fundamental parts, just making sure, uh, just if we take the microscope as an example, that you actually keep it clean. So if you have a lot of dust in your light pathway, that will deteriorate your image. Of course, you can use a cloning tool to get rid of your dust later on, but that gives you a lot of research ethical questions of what you are allowed to do, but also makes you spend a lot of time. So you want to make sure that uh, your uh, acquisition equipment is really in pristine condi condition, because that gives you a much better quality out. The other thing is making sure that you understand the tools that you're working with. And for example, with microscopy, the bright field lights that we have are working in a very broad range. You can uh, lower them down to get sort of uh, little light through or very high up. And this is done by voltage. So if you increase the voltage of your lamp, the color of that light will also change. So uh, a microscopy lamp is only white at one distinct voltage. It's not white all through but we often adjust the light of that uh, lamp to making it look nice in the camera. So that's the wrong way of doing it because then you are 
inducing a bias towards some colors and in reducing it in other colors. If you have a very a yellow light, of course, your blue colors will then be uh, really underrepresented in the image. So, so you want to make sure that you're working with white light and that you're sort of optimizing your curler position on the condenser of the microscope and these things to really make sure that your image coming in looks great. And I promise you that if you just spend that extra minute or two of doing that, you will spend, uh, save a lot of time in the end because the images will all look the same and would all look the best they can possibly do. The other thing of these uh, two things is that nowadays when you acquire images, all of the things that you would want to do in these two things, uh, do two points up here, to uh, making sure that your exposure looks well, uh, light is even and other things, are best done with the tool developed to acquire that image. So you have much higher possibilities to adjust these things in the best way when you do it in the acquisition software. So make sure that you are using the camera at the right sensitivity range for the images that you're taking and these things and do that in the acquisition software. So you don't want to leave the acquisition software before you have an image that looks acceptable. Small fine tuning can always be done later on, but you want to make sure that when you leave it there, it really looks nice. And then, then you uh, know that you have got the best quality of the equipment that you have there. And so by doing this, you're sure that you are always within the limits of what we find acceptable to do with images in a research setting. And this is, it's a, uh, I think, something where we all have our own limits to what do we think is acceptable. But it's a slippery slope. If you say that, well, this thing is acceptable, that thing is acceptable, then everything can sort of go awry with that. So when, with maintaining it without using Photoshop, you, you're sure that you can uh, be easily within those limits and don't have to think about um, the other implications of that. Of course, you can still induce research fraud, but it's not being done without your active participation in that way. And so this is one of the advantages of actually leaving out Photoshop for now. So you can take that as a challenge for your ne next work. See if you can generate it all without Photoshop. And I promise you that you can. I'm just thinking, I always use Photoshop for adjusting um, levels and corrective channels. Mm. One reason I do this is because I've always learned that when you acquire the image, it's important that you never ever saturate the pixel because this means you lose it lose information. Mm. Whereas if you want to publish the image, actually in order for the reader to see the image properly, you do need to saturate some parts of the image. Mm. Yeah, this is a big problem in Confocal that it's been pushed like that today, that many of the published images are o almost binary, that they are oversaturated in, in the cells and black outside. And this is very artificial. Our sort of, when we view that in a fluorescent microscope, the cells don't look like that. But we, as you say, we normally have to publish them in that way. And it is a big problem. I, I, I would want to work against it, but I see your point why you have to do this. And it's one of the big problems we have is that the confocal is acquiring in these three distinct channels. And they are black and white images. And then we just pseudo color them to red, green, and blue. But our um, eyes and also our printing presses are optimized g around green. So we have very sensitive uh, image viewing in the green channel. So any, a pixel with the same intensity in green, red, and blue would also, will always look more green than in will red and especially blue. So that's another uh, issue. How do you represent something in a quantitative way when our eyes are not quantitative? And our printing presses are definitely not quantitative and not good for uh, confocal imaging. So in my view of that is if you really want to show quantitative data with confocal, you're better off showing your individual channels as black and white to see the intensity of the channels. And then you make a merge with this pseudo coloring to look at which cells are double labeled and triple labeled. But if you want to do comparisons, it's never good to compare something between red and blue. 
So there, that, in that way, you can get around it. And also, the printing presses are much better in black and white than they are in green and these things. So that would be my argument, but it's, it's really not a black and white situation. So the other part here is then what you do with the image once it's acquired. So crop and rotate, change the size of the images, and annotate. And this is where I want to show you later on that it's, it's actually much better to leave this to the bitter end. Don't think about that when you have acquired your images. If they are a little bit skewed, if they are in the wrong the proportions of the image, if you want a, a square one and it's now a landscape image, don't do these things first. Because if you have cut it down, then you have discarded that extra information. And if you then have a, a panel in a montage where you want to make it a little bit more elongated to make it fit proportionally, then you don't have that data in it. So leave all that to the end. Our software are great managing this, and they, they make lower resolution versions of the photos that you put in. So you, don't, you can have images that are gigabytes in size and still work with them on, uh, in an InDesign document as rapidly as you would on a really low uh, quality JPEG image. So leave this to the end. Don't put Photoshop in there in between. So make sure that you have great data in and then don't do these things there. And absolutely don't do annotations and scale bars and these things in Photoshop. Because then you're locked into all of these things being sort of in the end burnt into your image. And they will be treated as part of that image. And this has very negative consequences in an online version of your uh, papers. Because you will see then that your data, your scale bars will be blurry, lettering will look uh, out of uh, sight in there, and it's, it's really much less quality than if you would use this in the InDesign in the end instead. So that's my sort of hate speech against Photoshop. It's not that I have anything personal against it. I use it also. But it's easy that you spend time in the things you know and don't sort of think about the broader alternatives that can be much better for, for your data. So now we're coming into the parts where I want to use uh, the time to show you a little bit of hands-on. And here we'll have the challenge of, uh, I hope that you will be able to see everything. And I'll try to zoom in in the places where I can. So I want to start with Illustrator, because I, I think that, that that is, for illustrations, your home. That is the, the input side, similar to the acquisition of your data with your microscope. This is where your ideas start when you want to do illustrations. And it also is the interlinking step when you clean up uh, graphs, when you put everything together. That, that's where you'll go into Illustrator. And the Illustrator has looked the same for the last 10 plus years, at least, in the basic principles. It has changed some of the aspects of the, how it looks, but may, many of the main things are really identical to the, what they were in earlier versions. So if you have um, version CS2, that will be perfectly fine for you to train. You don't, think, uh, you don't have to have the latest version of this to complete anything of the things that we are going through today. In all of the uh, Adobe software, you have nowadays a couple of these um, palettes that are sitting on the left side of the screen, the right side of the screen, and the top. And the first palette is, of course, this uh, toolbox on this side. And our pointers are on this axis here. So in Illustrator and also in InDesign, you have two different pointers. And that's a fundamental principle that sometimes you want to look at objects as a whole. And in other cases, you want to really go in and adjust aspects of an object. So when you're wanting to move a whole object, then you have the full uh, dark selection tool, this uh, dark pointer. And with the white pointer, then you have the direct tool of um, selecting this. Then I'm jumping down to this that looks like old traditional uh, calligraphy pen. 
And I don't know why they actually chose this icon for representation, but it's for the Bezier curves. D really, it, to me, doesn't make a lot of sense, but it's out of tradition. It's always been this icon. And so this is where I want to start today. And in Illustrator, when you start, you always start defining what is the purpose of your drawing. And the purpose of the drawing in Illustrator's view can be either for print or for uh, viewing on screen. I would recommend you that you do a little bit of a fusion of these things. So in, in the Adobe world, you have Illustrator working. For print, it's always CMYK. But for if you do on screen, then it's always RGB. But if it's on screen, then it optimizes some other things for being these low resolution on screen versions. I prefer personally to work in RGB also in this case to get to know that color space, but work for the print as well there. So therefore, uh, changing your color mode in the print version to RGB instead of the CMYK can be a good option there. So just for the example here, we start with the RGB and the A4 in landscape. So now you have a white page. And when making a drawing, you can then start to think about what are the basic fundamental shapes that you're working with. And that can be, for example, you have a, just a, a square. And as I said, as said before, then uh, you can represent these sharp things with very few points. So a square, you always only need four points, one in each corner. And these points don't actually even can be considered vectors because they, they are just connected to each other and with these lines in between. And a square is, of course, um, very easy to handle in many ways, also in uh, pixel-based versions. So, but with this square, we can now, of course, rotate it. And when you just rotated it, then it makes all the difference is if this is a vector graphics or a pixel graphic. Because now, in pixels, they cannot be rotated. They are always square in one direction like this. So you couldn't rotate a pixel 45 degrees and maintain the same information. But that is true for these vectors. So now, it just has this line in between as well. So how can we now making, make something that is a square into a circle? And that's where the Bezier curves come in. So by looking at this square, you can start to add a curve. And the, these, uh, the, uh, this pen tool, you can then put in and say that in this anchor, I can delete that anchor, or I can add other aspects to this anchor. So I can then go into that one. Let's see if I remember how to do that. And then add these handles. So what you see here now is that this point now has another aspect in it as well. And it has uh, points that you can uh, take and pull out, and you can move these around. And in, in this case, they are now linked to each other. Or sorry, they are not, but they could be. Um, if I was to use the right direct one here. So uh, they are linked, so they are always orthogonal. Um, no, they are not orthogonal. They are uh, 180 degrees uh, opposite to each other. So that means that if you pull one of these anchors, the other one moves with it as well. So by just having added these two points of pulling out and in, you can make a much more fluid shape. It still only has four points. So it's still the same original square as you used originally. But it has added two extra points that you can pull in and out. And by doing this, you can see that now we can actually start to generate a circle. So if I would have done this, this will not be perfect. But uh, just to show you the basic principle. So now, just by adding these anchors to each of these, I have something 
that is quite soft. And it, you can, by fine tuning this, get into a perfect circle. Of course, you always have the option to use a circle tool from the start. And then if you would see that here, compare the two, they are actually composited of the same thing. Sorry about that. So here in this circle, you see that you have, let's zoom in this in here as well. So you have the same four anchors at these same corners uh, that are this, uh, this square 45 degrees. And they give you this representation of a curve. And this is really the fundamental principle of Bezier curves. It's not many, uh, much more to it than this. But, but just because the, the interaction between the points and the anchors this is what makes the complexity of working with them, because they are not independent anymore. So you see that when, when I again move this, it both has the length of the uh, anchor here, gives you the curvation in between, and the direction gives you the tilt at that point. So this is really sort of def defining the slope at a specific point. And this can be used to really generate ma mathematically accurate images as well, because uh, d d you can uh, just derive the acceleration, and then you have the slope in this, uh, for example. So that, that's, that's a, a basic principle that you need to use here. And um, then we can start to make other things with these uh, points as well. So in the same tool here, you can now convert this to have the two anchors not being dependent anymore. So then we can start to actually have them, one being soft in one direction and another one being soft in the other direction. So later on, I'll show you how to really work with these handles to make something that looks very organic and a classical illustration as well. So that's the main tool that you will spend time in Illustrate is getting to use, used to this tool. And that's where it's worthwhile to, to spend that time and have your own examples on how to draw this. And, and there are many good tutorials out on the web that you can look at to get, get used to that. I, I think you can spend a lot of time describing it, but it's, it's just to get used to working with these tools. And you can see that they, they give you all the flexibility you need. Um, what you should be careful with working uh, with your shapes early on is trying to use as few of these points as you can. It's easy to say, well, in a, a circle, I need not only these four points, but I may want to have three in between here to make it really soft. So don't do that, because the more points you add, the more difficult it is to make these things look soft and um, attractive by many means. So illustration is very much about reducing data, reducing it down to the minimal you need to get the, the, uh, your point through. And Illustrator really pushes you to reduce it. So take that opportunity to make sure that you can get this down in, in number of points. And it will be much easier to work with. The other thing that you can use in Photoshop is really working with your primitive shapes. And the primitive shapes, of course, that are things like the circle that I showed you here. But it's also your square. And you can then do these multi-pointed uh, triangles and octagonals and other things. And those are done in the same tool where you have this rectangle you can choose to have the polygon tool. And with your polygons, when you click, you get up this question here. And you can choose that I actually want to have, I want to make an octagonal shape. And now you have made a very simple stop sign. And then you can drag that out, up like this. So once you now have 
your basic shapes, you can realize that many of the things that we do are just built up of these basic shapes. And that's the easiest way to get into making a complex drawing, is normally to start with um, these very simple shapes. It's like you, if you would look on the net how to draw Donald Duck. I think they always start up with these circles and you make it into a pear-shaped thing and then in the end it looks like a duck. And you can do that in the same way with Illustrator, that you start thinking about those primitive shapes. And then that you can easily make this into something that looks much more complicated than what you would be able to draw yourself with easy means. And how do we then do that? How do we combine shapes? And combining shapes in Illustrator is done through something called the Pathfinder. And the Pathfinder is one of the toolboxes. And toolboxes in Illustrator is the same thing as in Photoshop. You have them in a window, uh, in a, sorry, a menu like this one, where you can reach all of them. And that's normally the easiest way first to find where they are, because these, um, they, many of them are found out in this uh, palette on this right side of your space, but they are not very easy to understand which one is which. So uh, in the new Illustrator, I don't even know how the Pathfinder would look in that icon. So then we can go in here, and you have what's called the Pathfinder. Many of the palettes are clustered in a way that Illustrator seem, sees fit. And in this case, it's actually very true. So you have the Pathfinder combined with two of the other key tools in Illustrator. And this palette is really so the, the key to working efficiently in Illustrator, especially when you work with graphs. So you have uh, the Pathfinder, which I'll show you uh, just soon, and then you have the Align tool. And the Align tool, especially with the options down here, is much more powerful than you think. If you learn to use that in the right way, you don't need to build up a lot of grids, you don't need to look at alignment, look at spacing between objects, all of these things can be done with this palette. And it's much more efficient and exact than you can ever do with the other um, alternative means. The transform transformation toolbox is another thing that is key to making uh, data that are still quantitative in sizes. And this is uh, key if you are working with your graphs, taking them in from PRISM, from SPSS, Excel, making them into your final look. You want to make sure that you don't touch the internal relationship between your scales and other things there. So you want to make sure that the data is intact all through that process. And the transform toolbox is what makes th that whole thing possible. On the left side here in the transform toolbox, you have a grid of reference points. And the reference points are really very useful but easy to uh, do mistakes with. And reference just means where shall I have as my zero point. So when you're rotating something, you need to rotate it around its uh, uh, point of uh, zero in, in that. Uh, and also when it comes to scaling. So if you have your reference point in the center, like this, then things behave much like you would expect it to. So I can just show you how that would look when we go back to a square. So if I have this square and I then put my reference in the center and rotate this one 45 degrees, you see it rotates around its center of gravity there. If I then go back here, I can get it back to minus 45. And then I can now say that, well, I want to rotate it, but I want to make sure that it always keeps this interaction at this point. Then what I do is just to put my reference point for this square down in the left corner. And now I can again rotate this 45 degrees. And then it maintains that point, so it always keeps that point of reference, whereas if I would have had it in the center, it wouldn't have done that. So you can 
by just making sure that you have the right reference point there, do all of these uh, adjustments in a very easy way. The other tools do often use the same thing. And just to show you that it al also works when you do changes in your size, you can uh, just have this to be 45 points instead. So in this case, it scales to the center because I have my reference in the center of the object. While in this case, I may want, uh, again, to have the width being towards the other object that is this close to. So then I just changed my point of reference, and my scaling becomes very different. And that's useful, as I said, often working with graphs, but in many other cases as well. So the transformation toolbox is something that we'll get back to later on as well. But it's, it's one of those things that you can really use in quite an intelligent way to make sure that you can do easy calculations. But now I want to just focus a little bit on the Pathfinder itself. So I just drag this out, and you can always separate out your different tools. So you can have them on top of each other if I want to use these all three in one. So for example, here, you may want to make a simple shape. And that could be that I want to make a test tube. And then if you want to make a test tube, you may just want to make this one look a little bit something like this. So you, you want to have a tapered bottom, but you want it still to be elongated. And that you can easily do by just rotating some of these other things into um, the bottom area of the tube and put them like this. So you have. So you now have overlapping shapes. So you have these two shapes, and you have the bottom one there. So how can I go from these three shapes into something that is only the bottom one minus the top ones? And Photoshop works in this hierarchy. So you have something that is behind something else, has a sort of lower um, quality, and is then overridden by things that are at top in many cases. And it's easy to work with this if you're thinking that the thing you want to subtract should be on the top. So you put that on top, lay it in, and then you can subtract those away from the other things. So I, if you compare this, I make a copy of that. And then you just select all these three tools. And then you can go in to this one that says minus front. And now I've created uh, uh, something new that's completely symmetrical and has this a little bit more complex shape. And so that's an easy way of just making a very simple uh, drawing. The other thing you uh, often use is to unite two different uh, shapes. So if we make two shapes just looking like this, then we may want to make this into a lid of this test tube. And then again, you can select those two objects and then just unite them into one. And that's the first uh, Pathfinder tool here that's called Unite. And then again, you have made another complex shape just by unifying two uh, original shapes. And then you can put this on top there. So, by doing these kind of things, you don't need to work with your Bezier curves already from the start. You can work with these very easy primitive shapes and making that uh, fit together into these other shapes. So what's the advantage of doing like this? You could think about, well, I want to have my tip this one black, so I could just make two black squares together. Well, it's easy if you work with something like black without transparency, but once you're doing gradients and other things, you really want to make sure that each object that you are expecting to be one object should fit together. Because then you can change the color, can change all of these things that are fitting into that one as well. So that's the basic part of the uh, Pathfinder. You also have other ones that are can become more complex, and that is 
you only want the part that is intersecting between two other things. So in this case, uh, if I do the intersection only, that would actually give you more than two results. So you want to have only two of them. And you get this one. So that's the only part that was overlapping between the two shapes. So that's another alternative you can use in, in the Pathfinder. And the other parts are more esoteric than uh, I would go into to he uh, here, but they e um, aid you to divide something up into many sub-objects that you can work with. So that's the Pathfinder. Now let's see, we have 10 minutes more until coffee. So I may actually start to get into the transformation toolbox. And the transformation toolbox has more features than you see from the start. And the first question is, what units do you use? And here you see it has points. Points is not very useful for most people, but it's the traditional way of describing data and sizes in Illustrator. It's easily changeable, and I would suggest that you do that. So you have, in preferences, you have these units. And you can then go in and change your general units to be millimeters. So it then gives you a much better size representation. And it changes globally throughout your documents in Illustrator. So now everything you have there is millimeters. But it's by default in points. So it's good to make sure that you change this over. But it's not locked into using uh, millimeters just because it says millimeters here. So if I want to make a shape, um, again, my square, but I want to have this size being one inch in each of these. So I can uh, make sure that I sorry, can make this one inch in each side. So then you have utilized another measurement within the same transformation. So although it maintains all the representations in millimeters, you can still use it in inches if you want. So you can use that and you can use points or picas or any of these other quantities as well. Um, what you saw when I did this reshaping was that the width and the size of this object w weren't shape, uh, reshaping proportionally. And this is because this uh, link that sits between them was not pressed. So now when the, that link is pressed, you now have the possibility to reshape this proportionally. So you can at any time uh, switch between proportional reshaping or not. So you can maintain it as a square, or I may want to shape it to another shape, and then you start to use that again. So, so that can be switched back uh, on and off. Another thing in the transformation that you see here is that each uh, object has their coordinates. And this is uh, what I uh, mentioned to you when describing vectors, is that they all have an origin. So if you look at the easiest thing to understand that is if you have a line. So this line here, it now has a global origin that is dependent on where you have your point of reference. But each point also has its coordinates in space. So when I uh, do the direct selection of only this point of the line, it has its uh, own coordinates. And these are uh, over here. So they are re from your reference point, which is normally top left of your page. But you can put the origo anywhere on the page. So you can have zero at the bottom of your image, and then you can draw proportionally out from that. So you can move this by just changing uh, the uh, coordinates here. So if I want to move this 10 millimeters to the right, I just add 10 to this one. And then it moves this point to the right. However, it's more clever than that. You can also do basic mathematics in Illustrator. So if I want to move this 10 millimeters, but I'm not that strong on counting, I just put plus 10. And then it moves it plus 10. This also works in relative mode or in scaling of an image. So if I want to make sure that I have this one half the size, I can just divide the width with 2. 
or I can multiply it with three, and then I get a size that's three times as big. And this is very useful when you want to really scale things in a much more complex manner and maintaining proportions. But you can also write in here that I want to have this 27% of the original size, and it will shape to that as well. So you can really work with this in, in many uh, different ways to scale up and down and making sure that you maintain uh, internal proportions. And in theory, you can, with this tool, make your diagrams from scratch. So you can put in your raw data in a scalable manner here and, and get new graphs. I wouldn't recommend it, but it's uh, perfectly feasible to do. So that's worthwhile to know about the transformation toolbox. So do we have any questions on these tools? So when it comes to reference points, you don't have a square object as the shape of the reference point mm -hmm. using the tool. Uh, how do the points transfer to, for example, a circle or that complex shape mm -hmm. to live? So it uses an outer boundary. So when you look at a shape like this one, you see that it actually makes an outer square boundary. And it always makes this one. So if I would move, uh, rotate my square 45 degrees, well, that's actually a bad example because there it doesn't do it. Um, so you see, it, I take it back. It doesn't always do it, but it thinks about it in this reference point view. So if, um, it means that your circle, it will have it at the bottom corner of your most extreme points of the shape. So the outermost points, and then when you project out, that's where your reference point will be. And this is key when you think about the alignment tool as well, because that works in the same way, that you're always taking the uh, outermost box that you can fit the whole thing in, and that's your buildup of reference points. So, so now I thought we would uh, spend a little bit more time on the tools in Illustrator, but not to make this uh, morning too long, because I think uh, the main thing you want to do is to really get started and playing with these tools yourself in Illustrator. And that will be uh, sort of the, for the people that can fit in the hands-on this afternoon. That's what we are going to do, just to make sure that everybody can do all of these things in, in the Illustrator. And to do that, you also need to uh, just know a little bit of how to move around in the software and also to use this Align Toolbox. And the Align Toolbox, I thought I could go through now. So alignment, again, has the same question of reference. So where uh, in an uh, object do you refer to as your point of reference? And this differs between alignment of different ways. Um, so alignment, what you want to uh, make with that is to make sure that your objects are actually in the same point of reference in either your horizontal or vertical axis. And there are the classical ways of alignment is the way you work with text. So in, in the case of text, you have a center justified, left justified, or the right justified side. The same thing works with alignment. So if we have two objects, so if I just use the object tool here to create a circle, and this is something I should say to you that you have all of these modifier keys in Illustrator, that you are working with your keyboard in combination with your pointer. This is notoriously difficult to show you, but there are many of these modifier keys. So if you're working with the shift key, it makes sure that you keep proportions. So if I hold down the shift key and I, so let's zoom in a little bit, hold down the shift key and I pull out these, this circle tool, it becomes a perfect circle. If I don't hold down the shift key and I pull, then you see it has a free form of making um, a more oblong shape. So the shift key is a key to making these squares, perfect circles, and other things. The other modifier that you will um, actually use a lot is the option key. And when you hold the option key, it gives you the possibility to start at the center of the object that you're drawing. So if I now draw a new circle, 
pushing down the option key, you see that it is starting from the center of that circle. And if I, then I can press the, the shift key, it becomes a perfect circle. So you can do this while you're drawing the shape. Um, it would have been great also to have a third hand, but that's not really uh, an option in Illustrator. So what you can do then is to use, sorry, there, I just lost it, um, the pointers up and down. So if you want to modify something, you can use up and down arrow keys. And those up and down arrow keys are very useful if you're using the polygon tool. So when you use the polygon tool, as I said, you can you just click and define how many points this polygon should have. But you can also start drawing it. And while you keep it pressed down, you can use the arrow keys down and up. So you see when I use the arrow keys, I add more sides to this shape. So arrow up adds more sides, arrow down adds, uh, takes fewer sides. So you can easily there change down to a triangle. And again, the shift makes sure that this triangle then is kept in the right direction. And then you just leave it like that. So now I have uh, created shapes that are sort of geometric shapes just by using the shift key. So going back to alignment, we can then make these sort of classical toy shapes. So we have a square as well. We have then the option in, like with text, that we have them on top of each other. And we then want to center these shapes. But by that, you have the three simple adjustments in the vertical axis here. And the center one is the most straightforward, is center all objects. And then, you, so you select all three objects, and then you center them. So then they are aligned like this. This is very straightforward. Um, what is not straightforward is which object moves. And this is quite important that you may have an object of reference where you want to align all the other two. So you may not want to move all of them, but you want to have them aligned. And this is something, so you need to understand the principle that when you're aligning to the left, your leftmost object is the one that stays in place. And then it moves all the other objects to that leftmost one. So if I move my circle here, and then I select all three and align them to the left, the other two move to that place as well. And to the right, it's the same thing. To the center, it doesn't work that way. There, it's, it's very random which one will be your point of reference. And that can be quite frustrating. So I would um, recommend you, if you want to actually align center and you have one object of reference, your tool of choice is actually not the Align toolbox, but it is your Transform toolbox. So say that I have the objects like this, and it's my triangle that is the object I want to send to the other two. What you do is to select that triangle, you go back to the Transform toolbox, make sure that you have your reference point in the center, and then now you can use your X coordinate to uh, make sure that the other ones are at the same position. So then you can select all by Command A or Control A and copy that X coordinate. And now you can go back to the other objects and just paste that X coordinate there as well. So then you can keep track on that you are actually aligning all objects, but you are keeping your point of reference so that you are keeping the one that you want to keep in the right place. So that's where the transform and align toolboxes are really working in conjunction. The other thing is that, of course, you can do the same thing in the horizontal axis, and then you have the other three tools next to that. So then you have aligning top, center, and bottom. And those work in the same way, that the topmost is the point of reference for the other alignments as well. And the center, I would recommend not to use if you care about 
where objects end up in the end, but use the uh, transform toolbox instead. So the next thing in here is distribute and spacing. And the distribution here is a very useful tool. So what, what this means is that we can now go back again and generate a little bit of other shapes just to make this more simple to see. And when I have one shape, what I can do is, of course, to reshape that. And I keep the shift key pressed so that it maintains the same uh, proportions. And I just make this black. Um, if I want to make many copies of the same shape, what I can use is the option key again. So you press the option key, and you see now, if I just zoom in, is that your hour, uh, arrow ch changes to this double arrow. And this double arrow gives you the opportunity to copy this object easily. So then you just pull it to the side, and you get two copies. Sorry, move down there. And then you can do the same thing, uh, selecting both with Shift and using that uh, Option key again. So now I've generated four copies of this uh, shape. So when you have these copies, I can just make two more. And we have them here. Now these are sort of almost on line and almost uh, evenly spaced. But you want them to really be on the same line and evenly spaced. So I align them to the bottom. So you see that all move to the bottom most uh, circle, and then I can distribute all of these evenly in the horizontal axis. And that's the second one here. So then it distributes horizontally. In the other one, you would distribute them in the vertical axis, but it, with this one, you see that it moves the object slightly so you get them in per perfect distribution in between here. And that's very useful, but you may also want to distribute them with a known distance between the objects. And that you can set next to this distribute spacing. You can actually set here. That's interesting. You, no, it's actually not possible to select in here now. That was strange. OK. I will get back to why that wasn't selectable here. Um, it's, it's very useful in, uh, in design, uh, as I'll show you when making a montage. And there, I can actually select it. But uh, here, that's why you should always test the things you should show before. Um, you can't actually specify that. No, I couldn't. So like this. Ah, very good. Thank you. So uh, you're absolutely right. So that's, that's a special feature in Illustrator that you need to do that. In uh, InDesign, you don't actually need to double click on one object. But, but then you can specify this to be a one millimeter distribution between. And then when you do this, you then make sure that you always have one millimeter spacing between all the, your objects. So that's, that's very useful when making small lines between photos or other kind of things where you, where you want to have and maintain that the same way. So that's the align and distribution uh, uh, toolbox um, that you can use. Going back a little bit broader in Illustrator, how do you keep track of all your palettes? Because the palettes you will uh, see will move around a lot. And this has become easier and easier in Illustrator with the recent versions. So one thing you can always do, as I did initially, was to tear these uh, tools apart. And you can also put them back into the same type of triple version like this. So then you just pull them back onto each other, and they will merge, or they will move out like this. What you can do also, if, if you end up with having all these tools and you don't know where to put them, is to actually revert to the original look. And that's done up in the right corner, where you have 
uh, this box of palette layouts. And there the uh, illustrator has tried to make it into useful uh, composition of different palettes. So if you take uh, the essentials like this, it makes it very small and has most of your basic palettes on the left side. There are others that are optimized for layout, um, where you will see different artboards, and you can have one that is for tracing when it comes to converting pixel-based images to these vector-based images. But it also has in the bottom here resets. So if you go back to essentials and say reset essentials, it will make it into the clean sort of start position. So you can always go back to that and uh, clean up all your palettes, which is a nice feature. So the, this is uh, one place where I think the best for you is just to play around with all of these tools as soon as possible and know that you can always just reset this uh, up in that top corner and it, it's easy to come back to where you were. So, so that's, that's a good thing to uh, really play around with. Today I thought we were not to spend too long time this morning because some of the uh, examples I took took way quicker than expected. So I, I want to just end this today with discussing a little bit on f the file formats that you will hear and will talk about in Illustrator. And Illustrator has its own file format and it's called .ai. But it's actually not as unique as you would expect from that file format. It's what we call a superset of another file format, and it's actually PDF. So Illustrator is a fancy version of PDF files. And it means that most uh, applications that are PDF file compatible are also Acrobat file compatible. And the files that are stored, when you save a file, you can choose to make it really PDF compatible intrinsically. And what it means th for you is that you can always think that anything you do in Illustrator can be saved directly into PDF. You are never afraid of losing anything if you m move it to PDF files. And PDF files has become this really uh, common denominator where we move data in between. And why are the PDF uh, files so great to work with? Well, they are these uh, composite container file formats. They can contain really anything. They can contain text, and then it contains the text as reference, as I talked to before, with fonts. But the fonts are actually stored themselves in the PDF document. So it contains both the text and that typeset that you're working with. So the, the person that gets your PDF doesn't have to have that font on their computer. So that's a key thing. to. So you can always know that the person viewing your file will see the same fonts you have, even if they are very unique. And th that maintains the layout. But th these files can also contain the vector graphics that we are working on here, but also pixel-based graphics. And they can be merged together. So you can have a, a lettering on top of an image and an arrow. And they can be these three different things, one being a text, one being a photograph, and the third one being a drawing. And they are maintained as their original objects, so you don't lose any quality of that. The PDFs can also contain a lot of, a lot of other useful things, like being multi-page documents, being, uh, having movies in them, having 3D objects, having these forms that you always see. So it's a very large container. Um, what's, what's beneath uh, PDF and why it came up is that it, we needed this way of transferring data between different places. But it's a very complex file format and it has its own limitations. So if you go down one uh, level more, so if you have Illustrator being sort of the top, top version, the PDF down, then when you go down from that, we have a file format called EPS. And what EPS stands for is a, the encapsulated postscript. And postscript is really the core of the technique that you use to store this data. And the postscript is it's a version of, pro, uh, in a text-based manner, describe anything in these layouts. So where points are located, where images are, how they are stored. And it's the, the language of printers. So when you send something to your printer, 
it communicates in PostScript. And so this PostScript uh, is really the, the basis of all these other file formats. And by making the encapsulation of it into a file, it can be this file format of choice for when sending to publishers. So you will always, uh, when, when you see submission uh, in these web-based submissions, you will see options of being TIFF-based files, being JPEGs and other single Word documents, and there will be EPS files as well. In the early submissions, when you go to having for re review, it may also give you the option of uploading PDFs. But in the end uh, stages, they normally want you to upload it as EPS files. So these EPS files are your end target. When you're done with all your layouts, illustrations, and things for submission, that's where you want to make it into this EPS. And EPS has some drawbacks and pitfalls that we'll dig deeper on in the case where we're sort of working on uh, data for submission. But it's, it's really the, the end you want to reach with your illustrations and montages. So don't uh, work, spend all your time in Illustrator and in Design and save them as a TIFF file because then you have really lost all the quality that you have built up until that point. So you want to really um, end with the EPS in mind. So when, when you're now taking up your Illustrator, make your files work with them in the, in the Illustrator format, bring in data with PDFs and other things, and then try all of these things. And in this afternoon, we'll then work on uh, doing these things with the, getting started with Illustrator. So we'll uh, make sure you all get set up with the uh, installations and uh, getting used to these tools. So we can end with some questions for, for this morning session. Any more? Mm -hmm. Just some questions about alignment. Could you align the object uh, in relation to the page and not to other objects? So in relation to the page, you say, if, for example, if you want to center on the whole page. Um, to my knowledge, there are no really good ways of doing that with the alignment tool. What you would do is then to look at the full size of the page and then half that and use the X and Y coordinates. That's, that's the most straightforward way of doing it. Um, there are other, these sort of more of an ugly hacks version where you make a, a square that's the full size of your document. But, but it's better to use the x, y uh, coordinates for that. One thing I can show you more is actually how to change that point of reference for your page. And that can be another useful tool for you, is that if you actually show your rulers that you will see in this view here, you have something called show rulers. And then you get the rulers up in the top here that are based on the, the scale that we defined early on. So this is now in millimeters. What you have in the top corner here is actually the point of reference. So you see that at this point now, zero is at the top left corner of the page. But if I go to this one and pull out, I can now move that zero point of reference to be in the center of this, uh, this uh, circle. So now you see that this circle has the, uh, sorry, bringing back the tool. So then we can have this transform tool. Now you see that that uh, circle has the coordinate zero, zero. So that's possible t for you to redefine your origo, and then it's easier to align things on the page based on that. So that can be a way around that for alignment as well. When you apply images in the microscope, for example, you have several options. Uh, you can send images in different file formats. This would be the best one. Mm. I'll get back to that a little bit later, because it's a quite a uh, bit of a longer discussion around file compression and these things. But it's a, a good question um, that uh, we'll, we'll get back to, I think, tomorrow. Okay, so thank you all for coming. <laughs>